and let's see. I should be live now. Mm, can you hear me? All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay, 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 okay. I'm so sorry this took a little longer than I thought it was going to take. Um, good afternoon to all the teachers who are watching this webinar today. Uh, whether you're having lunch at school, staying at home, or simply watching this at a different time, I want to welcome all of you to this webinar. My name is Diego Ojeda, and I am a high school Spanish teacher at Louisville, Kentucky, uh, sorry, Louisville Collegiate School in Louisville, Kentucky. And today, as you can see on the screen, we're going to talk about leadership in the world language classroom. Um, so notice that it's not just that the title of the webinar is not the world language teacher as a leader. I'm going to refer to everyone in the world language classroom. That's why it's leadership in the world language classroom. Um, now, because everyone in the world language classroom can actually be a leader and must be a leader for language acquisition to happen. It is important that I let you know that many of the things I will talk about are um, in tune with the philosophy of comprehensible input. And uh, it is also important to listen to this webinar with your classroom in mind, as every example is just an analogy to your classroom. So let's start talking about leadership in the world language classroom. Okay, just as we do in the comprehensible input class, we're going to go slow. We're going to slow down. So, because I need to take my time trying to pace this presentation so I make it comprehensible to you. So, first things are always first. So, let's go step by step. In Espanol decimos paso a paso. And in that order of ideas, I must share with you all first, what is a leader? What is the meaning of the word, the word leader? Well, I have my ideas, but I wanted to be accurate. So I went on the dictionary to kind of like take a look and see what a leader is. But before that, uh, let's just remember that we are so used to see different types of leaders in the world, in our regular, days in our lives. We see leaders in the football field, like the amazing Aaron Rodgers, quarterback for Green Bay Packers, go pack. But we also see leaders at the hospital, at the clinic, like my own personal doctor, El Doctor Ferreira. We see leaders at school, like my headmaster of school, Dr. McCray. And we even see leaders in government. Hmm. But there's one thing. The leader in the football field doesn't look like the leader at the hospital or the leader that I have at my school or much less the leader in government. So what is a leader? If I have all these people who are leaders 
and they are so different. What is a leader? If we just go by the examples, it's going to be really hard to define what a leader is. So as I mentioned before, I decided to look up at the word in the dictionary. As I needed help trying to determine what a leader was. And the dictionary, my friends, says that a leader is the person who guides or directs, the person who guides or directs a group and that that group, such group, recognizes his or her authority. Hmm, okay, I, I think I got it. Uh, so um, this actually applies to all of the examples that I was giving you before, because it applies to the football field. You can see that the quarterback calls everyone to the center of the field before each play, and they all listen. They follow their, their leader. They are recognizing his authority in the case of Aaron Rodgers. It applies also at the hospital. Um, unfortunately, I had to go to the hospital yesterday and uh, I saw how Dr. Ferreira was talking to his nurses, giving indications, and they were doing everything that he wanted them to do. And this also applies at school. When the headmaster calls for a meeting, we all go. When the headmaster gives us a direction, we want to go in that direction. See? And somehow it also applies to government because in their own way they are guiding a, a group and in one of the other way that group is recognizer, recognizing their leader's authority even if they don't like some of the decisions. So the quarterback can be someone very likable by their team, someone who everyone listens and respects. The teacher can be respected, appreciated, someone who's followed by their students and their community. But we must be realistic. And we know well that there are situations in which the leader is not respected, followed, or even heard by their group. So I decided that this dictionary definition wasn't helping me a lot. I felt like I needed more information. I must be honest with my colleagues, and I needed to dig a little deeper in order to really find out what a leader is, what is leadership. After all, I cannot just come here to this webinar and tell you that you ju just because I'm presenting this webinar, I know everything and I'm the leader and that you have to believe everything that I say. I cannot do that to you. I cannot tell you that you just must follow me and do what I say just because I'm the person, the voice behind the images in this webinar. Okay, what is a leader? Looking for the definitions, someone who guides a group and somehow that group follows them. But sometimes as teachers, we face tough situations. And we tend to idealize other colleagues and we want to be just like them. And we want to do just what they do, forgetting that each one of us has a different reality, a different context to deal with day by day. So I'm saying this because the question is, is the leader someone that we just follow blindly is the leader someone who we want to um, uh, imitate and do exactly what they're doing? Hmm, I don't know, what do you think? 
So in your classrooms, do you want your students to be mini use, little copies of who you are? So I kept looking further and found that leadership is a synonym of direct, too direct. Mm, let's go back to the classroom, to the language classroom. It is obvious that the dictionary is telling me that a leader is someone who directs, not someone that imposes. Oh, okay. So that means mm, that sometimes we confuse leadership with imposing. So the students have to do whatever we tell them to do. But keep in mind that a leader that imposes is just a dictator. And we don't want to be a class dictator. We don't want to be a teacher dictator because that is not leadership. I kept looking in the dictionary and I also found that leadership, leadership also means going ahead, to go ahead, to show the road ahead. That's my interpretation. So let's think about the classroom again and let's analyze what means going ahead from that perspective, from that point of view. Okay, look, we teach young people. We teach teenagers, or another word for teenagers is adolescents. Sorry for my pronunciation, but adolescents, which means that they lack of something, right? Of course, they're growing. Uh, they lack of, um, you know, many things that as adults we already have, and maybe we're tired of having already, but, uh, it's natural for, for teenagers, for adolescents, to believe that they are the ones who are always ahead of the game. They look at us, they see how we dress, they see how we speak, they see what kind of music we hear, and they feel that they are way ahead of us. But somehow, we are the ones who have to demonstrate that we are the ones who are ahead of their game, but not by imposing. Look, friends, we could avoid many, many discipline, bad discipline situations in the classroom if we only understand that we must be at least one step ahead of the student's behavior. If we know that there's a student who likes to act out like a clown instead of waiting, instead of waiting for, for that behavior to happen, we must put ourselves one step ahead. Let us be the first ones making the first, taking the first step, making the first, the second, and the third joke in class. Okay, fine. Not everyone feels comfortable uh, telling jokes to the class, but you can gather their interest by telling them, telling them a little story, by telling them something that just happened to you or at school in the world, meaning that you need to take that leadership, okay? Do not wait for the behavior to happen. Always be one step ahead of their game. And if we were not the first ones to make the joke, if Mr. X just told a joke to the class, let's just not get upset. Let's try to find the humor behind that joke and actually let's try to use it as a prop for the class. 
Look, I've been teaching for a very, very long time. And uh, I have had so many different situations. And I have gotten upset when a student, even before I said the first word, made a joke and made the others laugh. Now I realized that I was doing something really bad. I mean, I got upset because people were laughing. Shouldn't that be something good? Anyway, so use that as a prop. This is actually perfect for the language class where any topic can be discussed in the target language. Let's just remember a little bit of advertisement here that the word language class is not a class to talk about the language. It's a class to actually use the language. So our classes should be an excuse to use the language. Yes, we have topics, we have units to cover, maybe. But you know what? In the end, the most important thing is that you're using the language. I'll get to your units and your topics later. But as long as you're using the language, you are doing something good in the classroom. So when we do that, uh, when we're one step ahead of the student, uh, when we do not get defensive because the student made a joke or made a comment. Um, we have to have an attitude that actually diffuses the disruptive, disruptive intentions of the student. That is if there's actually an intention to disrupt because that's the other thing. We believe that things in the classroom should be one way. And the moment the things are different from what we think they should be, then we consider that a disruption. But is that comment that the student made really a disruption or they actually have need a moment to take something out? Is the joke a disruption or is that telling you that they feel comfortable in your class so they will take tell a little joke to their classmates before we start the class? Sometimes we assume that negative behaviors are just a consequence of a, a will, a desire to sabotage the class. But in reality, they can be the result of many situations that not even the student is uh, able to control. See? Some uh, times these behaviors have been incubating from different places. We know this, from home, from a conversation in the hallway that they just have with their friends, or even from society in itself. I have been living in the United States for the last 20 years. I'm originally from Bogota, Colombia, and I came here as an adult. And uh, I think that's the best thing that could have happened to me because, not because I don't love my country, I love my country with all my heart and my people and my family, but because living in Bogota for over 30 years and driving in Bogota for over 30 years, I started noticing that I have slowly but surely becoming an aggressive driver. And um, when I came to the States, to the state of Wisconsin, close to Madison, Wisconsin, a rural, a rural school, uh, and everyone was driving so peacefully and kindly, I felt out of place. Um, I was just waiting for the moment where I had to be the Colombian driver. So we expect our students to come to our classroom with a peaceful attitude. But where are they coming from? That is the question. Where are they coming from? On what are we going to do to 
help them understand that this place is a safe place. Okay, let's consider a situation in which a student has, a, has some racist behaviors by making fun of Hispanic people. And I'm saying that because I'm Hispanic and I have gone through these things. Or joking about immigrants, bringing up stereotypes. This is when we as teachers have to be ahead of the game. We cannot just wait for these situations to happen. We must be open to conversations that are tough. We must be open in our classes to talk about tough issues because it is our responsibility to inform and help them analyze difficult situations from more than one point of view. When I talk to many of my colleagues, my teachers, uh, teachers around the country, some of them say, you know, I, I just, I don't like to get polit political. Well, since four years ago, uh, talking about important issues became being political. So we don't wanna get political because we wanna, don't wanna hurt feelings. And that's what's happening in many schools. We don't talk about the issues. Let me tell you something, a leader, a leader brings honesty and a leader must touch on every issue, the happy ones and the sad ones. We cannot just ignore certain behaviors or certain situations that are going on in the world. Because I'm not just talking about the United States of America, I'm talking about the world. So it is important that before even those comments happen in class, you have already talked to these kids about immigration. You don't have to, you know, take a side. You just inform them. Let's, let's just talk about immigration. You might hear some rough, nasty comments, but you, must, you might also hear uh, points of view that are very, you know, well put. So you create a debate, a discussion on this. And I understand that, that this is not easy. I remember that uh, what I ended up doing uh, at a rural school where I worked for uh, many years, a few years ago, uh, when I was the only minority teacher so um, the first thing that during parent-teacher conferences, uh, a parent asked me was, how come you're not cleaning the floor? How come you're not working at McDonald's? But I was just recently shipped from Colombia. So in my head, I was just gonna answer the question and I just said, oh, because I studied to become a teacher. And I became a teacher, and that's why I'm here teaching your kid. And I smile. Now, that was 20 years ago. If someone asked me the same question today, I don't think I'm going to be able to give the same answer. But anyway, I'm just trying to give you a picture of that uh, environment. Um, in class, uh, many students will make fun of my accent in English. If you could call that English at that time, can you, can you imagine if I have an accent now and my English is horrible? At that time, it was cavern language. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't English. So anyway, no wonder why they were making fun of me. Uh, but then I start seeing a connection between that and between the topic of immigration and illegal immigration and all these things. And this is 20, 18 years ago. So I'm like, okay, how can we talk about these things if everyone in the classroom pretty much thinks exactly the same about immigrants uh, and not good things. So this is not something that you have to obviously, 
But what I did was that I set up the chairs on a circle and um, I placed my, I gave every student a post-it note and I placed myself in the middle of the circle on the floor and I sat on the floor and I put on top of me my black coat. And I told them, you have to write everything that you have heard or believed about Hispanics and about immigrants in the United States of America. And when you're done, you're gonna come to me and you're gonna put that post-it note on my coat. So I did that. And um, obviously no names. And when they were done, I took the coat and I waited for them to leave. And then I start peeling out each one of the sticky notes and reading uh, all the things that they consider true about Hispanics and immigrants in the United States. It wasn't easy, but it was the best lesson plan I have ever created in my life. I had many things to talk about. We watched videos, we presented uh, different stories, we read Jorge Ramos, and uh, a couple of his books. And uh, at the end of the year, you could see some different perspective. So we're talking about leadership. We're talking about second language classes, like Spanish class in my case. So the message here is we must be one step ahead. If we only celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month with papel picado, piñatas, uh, tacos, uh, maracas, and um, queso, we really are not getting ahead of the students. Why? Because that's what they all see every day in the media. Hispanic Heritage Month is nothing but a huge commercial that every business in America takes advantage of. And then we start believing what we see on TV, on the big screen, or even when we go for a Big Mac and suddenly the Big Mac is dressed up as a quotations, Hispanic person. No, we must, yes, I'm not saying that we should not celebrate, see? But those are just part of the Hispanic community. Yes to celebrations, but let's not hide the real life of the Hispanic community. Otherwise, they won't need us. They will have more than enough with what they have seen on TV. We need to think, what do they not see? What is the step ahead that we need to take? Well, we need to talk to them about people in our community who are from this heritage, who are doing great things for us. Yes, they are not celebrities. They are not athletes but they are doing great things for our community. We can talk about our Hispanic business, for example, in uh, our community as well. And this is applicable to um, every language, you know? Think about the stereotypes that students and uh, people have about French people, about France, see? We need to be one step ahead of uh, those things that they consider are uh, the things that identify these cultures or Italy or Germany, see? But how can we connect our students to the real culture behind our classes? Well, most of the times when we are trying to find 
an answer, we do not realize that we have that answer right in front of our face. I misplaced the keys this morning. Well, they were in my pocket. Where did I leave my cell phone? Aren't you talking on your cell phone? That's how life works. So how can we uh, help our students understand uh, the culture, the target culture? How can we be leaders taking that first step? Very simple. You need to share your personal story. No, no, I'm not talking about private things. I'm talking about your personal story, that story that will allow them to know what connected you to the target language. How did you become a language teacher? Yeah? What made you become a language teacher? Because sometimes we don't share those things with our students. We just assume that they know that we're the teacher because we're the teacher, we're in front of them, and we are the ones giving the class. But it's important to share with them how did you become that target language teacher. And I know that not all of you are native speakers. Uh, to say that you teach a language just because you're a native of that language. Many people think that, right? No. We all have different experiences. Share them. Share them with your students because that makes them dream. That makes them think about their future. They, that makes them think about family members or friends. They start seeing you as a human being. And yes, Leaders, real leaders, are human beings. Talk to your students about sensitive topics that affect the communities that speak your target language. We can do this, as I said before, in many objective ways. But allow your students to know you as the person who can bring to the table things that they have never heard about at home or even in other classes. This is leadership. Bringing up tough issues is a leadership because when we bring up a tough issue, we're saying, I want to hear you. What do you think about this? And that is leadership. Okay. Okay. Now, we have all worked in different contexts. I have been a middle school teacher. I have been a uh, high school teacher. I have worked for uh, universities and colleges. And I'm sure that you have your own experiences. What I'm sharing today is not coming from my current experience here where things seem to be working well. You know, maybe you have seen my name somewhere. I, I don't believe so because I'm not a celebrity or anything like that, but maybe. And maybe the first thing that you think, oh gosh, this activity is kind of cool. This guy must be such a successful teacher. Wow. Um, well, let's just face reality here. I'm a teacher. And as a teacher, I have good days and bad days. And what I'm sharing right now is not coming from a current experience of having most of good days, days where things seem to be working well. No, what I'm sharing here is a combination of all those things that I have seen and I have lived and I have been told as a teacher. So how can you be a leader in your world language classroom? I know we've been talking about this, but just making the question again so we don't forget what we're talking about. I understand that there can be frustration about the state of education in the United States, uh, which is the reflection, it's a reflection of the state of society, uh, which is a reflection of the political uh, turmoil. Um, frustration is human. 
And I understand that we as teachers can be frustrated by many things. We see that students are not, not very enthusiastic about the language class, and that really drains you. It makes you feel tired. It makes you feel crabby. It makes you feel ordinary. It makes you feel like you don't have any value. And the problem is that that feeling invades not just your professional life, but also your personal life. And what happens? We get home feeling the same, carrying this with the gray cloud, brainy cloud on top of our head. Look, I know this because I'm a teacher, number one. Number two, I talk to teachers. And number three, because I pretty much read all everything that word language teacher write in social media. Yeah, you can tell, my wife can tell you that I'm obsessed with social media. And I read all these comments. I do not get involved in all of them because I, I'm not here to give you personal advice, uh, but I do read them. And I will say that at least 70% to 80% of those posts are describing very challenging situations, both professional and personal. And they all stem from the same, the student's attitude in the classroom or uh, lack of administrative support or very low salaries that we cannot live with. So how can we be leaders? How can we become leaders if we are facing this reality? If we're stressed out with what's happening and to that add our personal lives. We all have personal issues because life is not simple. How can we become leaders if we are tired? How can we become leaders if we are concerned about what we will be bringing home to our kids. Sometimes, as we can't really say what we are feeling, we resort to sarcasm. And sarcasm, my friends, is a double-edged sword. Sarcasm, while can be smart and sometimes funny, can also be the worst way to offend someone in our classes, meaning our students. So we end up putting our students on the defensive. So sarcasm is not the answer, see? Yes, we all have a different life when we all have problems, but somehow we must arrive or receive each class with a positive attitude. So, how can we be leaders even if we're struggling in other areas of our personal and professional lives? We need to be positive. We need to reflect a positive attitude, but that's not the fake smile. <laughs> no, no, no. We have to tell ourselves, I need to be positive before my next class. I need to be open-minded before my next class, and I'm going to enjoy these kids. Look, I'm going to tell you a very good example that happened today to me, my first class. Many of the students in that class are soccer players, and they were competing in one of the stages of the state tournament, but they lost yesterday. And my school is very supportive, uh, in the sense that everyone goes to the game, so all the kids were there, well, they lost. So this morning, I was ready with my lesson plans. We were going to talk about personal identity, the concept of beauty is my AP class, and uh, we're going to talk about my grandma, because to me, identity and beauty, everything brings my grandma, you know, it's, it's an image that brings many of those topics together. So if you're an AP teacher here, the secret, you know, combine those topics. Do not study those topics isolated. Okay, sorry. Okay. So anyway, um, I have my lesson plan and I project my agenda on the board. They came. 
dragging. Hola, señor. Hola, ¿cómo están? Sigan adelante. Teléfonos aquí, por favor. I collect the phones. Sí, sentados. I was going to start the class. And I was like, I cannot do this. I cannot do this to these students. A uh, few years ago, I would have been upset because I didn't feel the energy from my students. So I would have taken that personal. And I would have said, you guys, come on. This is a Spanish class. You don't know how much I spend making these lessons for you guys. You know, the guilty trip. Oh, please don't, don't do that. The guilty trip is the worst thing that we can do. And that's not a leadership trait. So anyway, I decided to change my plans on the fly. And I told them, okay, uh, please take your uh, annotations notebook and just write me two pages on how you're feeling right now. What? Yeah, how are you feeling? So I was trying to give them an outlet. So they, they wrote. And then I brought up the markers and I told them, please draw or write in Espanol, obviously, anything that can give me an idea of what you just wrote in two pages. So they came and they draw uh, friends. After 40 minutes, my, I teach the block. Mm. After 40 minutes, the environment was absolutely different. It was energetic, there were laughs, there were smiles, they were ready. So I took it from there, see? Uh, but I had a positive attitude to that specific situation. Friends, I'm almost done. It is very important that our face shows positivism. Yes, teachers are kind of actors sometimes, but why do you go to the movies? Why do you go to a theater to forget a bit about your real life, right? Why cannot we do that for our students? We need to be actors as well. Our face should reflect positivism, optimism, happiness. I'm not asking you to always have to fake a smile. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that before each class, we should make a conscious decision that we will receive our students in a positive, calm, and welcoming way. No matter if we didn't sleep last night, no matter if my daughter Sophia spent the night laughing and I wasn't able to sleep, you know, because this happens to kids with autism, or if the world is falling to pieces. If we're going to bring that to the class, if we're going to bring our tiredness, if we're going to bring our sadness for the world, that's what the students are going to end up, uh, that's how they're going to end up seeing life as well. So say to yourself, leader, I'm going to enjoy every student today. I'm going to enjoy every student today. I'm going to enjoy the student who makes jokes, the student who is always looking outside of the window. I'm going to enjoy the student who <laughs> reminds me when I was a student. I was such a good student. Oh, my favorite student, because we all just want copies of mini me, right? And just for the record, I was a horrible student in high school. Yes, I became a teacher. Ooh. I'm going to enjoy every student because this is what I have decided to do with my life. How many times do we say that to ourselves? I'm going to enjoy every second in the classroom because that was my decision. I decided to be a teacher. Regardless of the things that I saw when I was in high school, because I saw a lot of kids giving trouble to teachers. I was one of them, unfortunately. Maybe I became a teacher just because I want to say I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, uh, your brain works in really weird ways. But regardless of my behavior in high school, I decided to become a teacher. I need to be psychoanalyzed. 
After listening to this webinar, please take a moment to think what motivates you as a person, your family, your beliefs, yourself, what motivates you as a person, and also what motivates you as a teacher. What motivates you to become a teacher, to be a teacher? What made you decide to become a language teacher, a Spanish teacher, a French teacher, a German teacher? In my case, uh, I wasn't encouraged. I was made to be a teacher, and not in the sense of that I made that decision, but in the sense that um, I, I went to school to study literature. I wanted to be a writer. And after I graduated, um, I was just at home. You know, Hispanic people after college can live at home, not because we're losers, but because family's so tight. And my dad came and said, asked me, um, so what are you going to do now that you graduated? And I said, absolutely nothing. It's like, what? My dad is a, a professor. And I said, yeah, I went to college uh, to be a writer and writers have to think. And that's my job. <laughs> my dad was like, no, 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 no. If you want to keep eating and sleeping in this house, you need to find a job. Well, I forgot after two weeks what he had said. After two weeks, he asked me, have you found a job? I'm like, no, I mean, a job as a writer? Come on. And he said, well, you know, I have a friend who has a school and I talked to her, you need to go there on Monday. That was my first experience as a teacher and take into account that I didn't study to become a teacher, all right? So uh, to be a teacher is not easy. To be a teacher is not to be a leader by default. Imposing doesn't make you a teacher. Imposing doesn't make you a leader. So these are things that we need to, to think about. Um, in my first contact with students, real students, I was 21 years old. I, um, my students were 17, 18 years old. We were very similar in many ways, but they did not pay attention to me. They did not respect me. I thought that just by carrying the title of teacher, they were going to respect me. And, uh, Paso a paso, step by step, I understood that the best way to become a teacher leader is to uh, get to know your students. Uh, play a little soccer, ping pong, tennis, basketball. Doesn't have to be high impact sport, but play a game with them, cards, uno during lunchtime. Hmm? Talk to them. Just sit at their table. Uh, pretty soon, they're going to be the ones wanting to sit with you. And they're going to start to hear what you have to say. And they're going to start respecting you. And uh, when I realized that I had to get to know each student as a person, that's when I saw results in my instruction, especially in the class that I was teaching literature. Literature is about life. And uh, if you don't make the connections between their life, real life, and what you're reading on books, it will be pretty hard to get the results that you want and to invite them to think in a more critical way. So, Again, you don't have to get too private for them to realize that you're trying to connect with them and that you're dedicating some of the your personal time to them. See? Um, the students are the best face and attitude readers you can find out there. Um, it's important that we set up a, a stage with positivism 
to uh, become leaders in the classroom. It is important that by or through your leadership, you are building a new world to your students. Each class is a microcosmos. Each class is its own entity. And when you make that class a place of welcoming, a welcoming place, you're building new worlds to them, not physically, but also mentally. And then you start finding out what kind of things you all have in common. So all of the sudden, you start enjoying what they are telling you. I have heard so many teachers concerned saying, oh my gosh, I need a little bit of the adult world because I'm starting to enjoy my conversations with my kids. That's the sign of an amazing teacher. That's the sign of a leader. Good for you. Good for you. Okay, I know that they say 45 minutes. Uh, we had a little glitch at the beginning of the webinar. I have so much more to say. Um, and I'm really, really honored that you have taken uh, some of your personal time to listen to this webinar. And uh, please stay in touch. I need to get ready for my next class. Hasta la vista. Adios. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.